Hi, my name is Neil, and I have a body. And my body is worth quite a lot to the right person. It's got about a kg of phosphorus, that's worth about $300. Almost the same amount of calcium, that's worth about $250. The nitrogen alone is worth about a tenner. I know a guy. All told, it's about $600. A little less. But that's silly. You'd have to go through such expensive processes to obtain the constituent parts. There were so many other ways to make money out of the human body with far fewer steps. Let's do a fucking video essay. Rolling sound, abstract take two. So in this essay, we're going to talk about, and I'm absolutely fucking terrified by the way, just saying, we're going to talk about bioethics. And we're going to talk about what Margaret Jane Radin called contested commodities. Or to put it another way, the commodities where we feel a deep sense of unease, a personal and social conflict about the process and the results. We're going to talk about organ selling, surrogacy, and sex work. So we're not getting monetized and we've made the decision to censor not a fuck nor a shit nor a fuck shit stack and to not talk around the issues at all or use euphemism. This is our essay and these are subjects that matter to us so if you can at all help and you feel like you'd like to you can support the channel over on Patreon and if not no worries just sit back and enjoy. We're going to try to be dialectical. This isn't a thing bad essay, nor is it a thing good essay. I'm not like the other video essays. I'm dialectical. And that means we're just going to examine the phenomena through some critical lenses, and probably I will tell you how those lenses make me feel. But this won't be a fruitless exercise either, because while I can't be certain to have a fixed moral stance on these issues, there is actually an angle of praxis, because whether you position yourself as a backer of universal commodification, or you back universal non-commodification, or even if you're somewhere in between, we're not going to lose sight of the people we're discussing in this essay. The workers who have not historically been recognized as such. And while I expect the discussion of ethics and morality will continue to be interesting and thorny, my support for and solidarity with those workers is unwavering. And while we're doing it, we're going to make some Satan. So what are the ways you can make money with your body? Well, with a body like this, you're going to make money all kinds of money. You can use your hands and get dirty and make some seitan, which, you know, it's not complicated. You just have to know what you're doing with wheat gluten. But uh, wheat gluten isn't that much cheaper than just buying shop-bought seitan, so it's probably not a very smart way to make money. Neither is starting a YouTube channel. So I should probably just sell a kidney. I know a guy. So a cup of wheat gluten and about a quarter cup of plain flour, if I can manage it. So if you're in the global north, which is, with some exceptions, a fancy way of saying the countries who did the colonizing rather than the countries who were colonized, anyway, if you're in the global north and you find yourself needing a kidney, you might be in trouble. Kidneys filter your blood. They make urine. They're a major organ, and when they fail, you, you die. The thing is, every person has two kidneys, and we actually only need one. When one kidney fails, they both fail, but remove a kidney from a healthy person and the second one will compensate, which means that kidneys are one of the few organs where a living person can give up their kidney, give up a part of their body, and then be fine. People with one kidney live just as long as people with two and are at no greater risk of kidney issues than the general population. The recipient is in better shape too, because living kidney donations do better than donations from cadavers. But the thing is, if you're in the market for a new kidney, it isn't actually a market, because the vast majority of global north countries have outlawed 
paid organ donation. You can donate an organ altruistically, usually because a person you love needs one, but you cannot be compensated for this donation. Some countries offer tax incentives or allow compensation for time off of work, but it's meant to be minimal. It's supposed to not push someone to give up a part of their body in order to actually profit. See, there's a big problem with organ donation, and that's that far too few people do it. Not every dead person can donate, only people who have died in specific ways. And living people have to be coaxed and guilted into just donating blood, which is a relatively minor and painless procedure. It lasts about 20 minutes, not like giving up a whole organ from your body, which, while actually pretty safe, still has all the risks of surgery. So there is a global shortage of organs. If you get put on an organ waiting list for a kidney, you're more likely to die on the list than you are to get an organ. But wealthy people have a solution, transplant tourism, where wealthy people fly to different countries and acquire an organ. This industry accounts for around 10% of all organ donations. It is often unclear where the organs are sourced. Some are the result of non-consensual trafficking, and let me be clear here, there is no moral justification for this. Like, you can play utilitarian ethics games, explore the famous thought experiment where a man with no ties to the world walks into a hospital where five people need organs, do we kill this random lonely guy, etc? But we're not going into that in this essay. By the way, do you know the philosopher who came up with that thought experiment? Her name was Philippa Foote. No? Haven't heard of her? She also came up with the trolley problem in an essay about abortion. We all know the name of that psychologist who came up with the revolutionary advice to clean your room. Professor Gordon J. Schneeberschnee. But I hadn't heard of Philippa Foote until this essay, even though her work is everywhere, and even though she only died in 2010. Because woman! And you probably didn't know that that essay was linked to examining the politics of abortion. Because it's all well and good to philosophize about six people dying on a railway track, but who boy, heaven forfend, when we discuss ethics that we actually discuss ethics. But I digress. For the purposes of this essay, we're just going to say that people who kidnap others in order to sell their organs for profit are bad, actually, and we're not going to debate whether they're still bad if the person who needs them is a famous violinist or whatever. But there's another group of monetized transplant donors, and those are people selling their organs to make money. So here we are in a world with a global shortage of organs, and we've got willing compensated donors. They are poor, with most living under the poverty line. They're illiterate, largely, and work manual labor for low pay. They often give their organs not in order to set themselves up for a good life, but to pay off debt. In Pakistan, for example, donors are often individuals who are in debt-bonded slavery, attempting to buy their way out. But many individuals, post-donation, have insignificant capital to rise up from poverty and end up back in debt. Which is the grimmest thing I've ever said on this channel. <sighs> Let's rinse out our Satan Neil, Neil, and... Neil, not a song for this one. Right. Yes, right. Sorry, Sarah. Where were we? Uh, so I guess we're zoning in on an ethical dilemma. If you've got a willing donor and a person in need, is it moral to just let someone die. There are 6,112 people currently waiting for an organ transplant in the UK and 107,000 people on the list in the USA. Each day, 80 people receive an organ, but another 150 are added to the list. 17 people die each day while they're waiting. 40% of people who need a kidney in the US will die while they're waiting. It's somewhat better here in Ireland, where in 2017, there were 650 people waiting on the waiting list, and between 5% and 20% of waitlist patients die while waiting for an organ. And there are people who are willing to sell their organs. It would be on the black market. The person may be economically disenfranchised, but they exist. And it's very easy to say straight away that you would never take advantage of someone's poverty like that. That's how I feel anyway. I'd never do that to save myself, I don't think. But if someone I loved needed an organ, if a partner needed one, if one of my children did, if Huckleberry needed one. I've heard people talk like they'd take a bullet to save a loved one, but would they subject a stranger to a medical procedure with weeks of recovery time to save a loved one? I, I don't know my own answer, to be honest. I think if I said with any certainty that I would never consider that, then maybe I'd be lying. And if I did consider it, would you blame me? It's not like live organ donation is inherently bad, right? 
if our laws reflect morality, which... <laughs> nope. Then organ donation isn't bad on its own. We allow altruistic donation. We allow people to go through the body horror of donation in order to save their children, their spouse, their friend. When a random person decides to give an organ for pure altruism, for a mikvah, we can set off a whole daisy chain of organ donors. This person wants to donate for his father and isn't a match, but is a match for this little girl whose auntie is willing to donate to this NB person who has a partner who could donate to, etc. There are stories of this happening in three people, ten people, thirty people getting new, life-saving kidneys. When someone wants to give on pure altruism alone, we call them heroes. When someone wants to do it for money, we... Well, at best, we think they're kind of morally repugnant, but we also might worry that they were pressured. In a way that we don't seem to worry about, pressure for people mining cobalt or picking bananas or incinerating garbage. But we've decided, when it comes to organs, it's immoral. They should go work another job. You can sell the labor of your body, the action of your hands. Your employer is hiring you to do a handful of specific things, like wash dishes or answer calls or... Yeah, they have some control over your body. They can tell you whether you're allowed to sit or lean or whether you're allowed to leave your desk to pee or you have to hold it in. They can have a strong stance on the whole wearing makeup thing. But that's like renting your body, isn't it? Selling your body feels different somehow. A moral job like tanning leather or working with chemicals or that person incinerating garbage or working one of those horrible factories where they make iPhones or, you know, mining, that's moral. There's actually one country in the world which doesn't have a shortage of organ donors, Iran. Iran has a legal and centralized system for living organ donation. There, would-be donors are compensated $1,200 by the government and are given a year of health insurance and receive between $2,300 and $4,500 from the recipient through one central regulated nonprofit. Scholarships and charity donations are given on behalf of recipients who can't afford to pay their donors. Any other transfer of money is illegal. You can't pay middlemen or the medical team. It's all done through the government and a centralized medical nonprofit. The program was established in 1988, and by 1999, the whitelist was fully eliminated. If you live in Iran and need a kidney, you can, in theory, get one with the same wait time as any other medical procedure. Economists Gary Becker and Julio Elias have estimated that taking into account the slight donor risk and the days off work, Offering a payment of $15,000 would be sufficient to ending the shortage of kidneys in the U.S. But of course, the U.S. doesn't have a centralized healthcare provider or a system where state-backed charities help people who can't pay. Without big changes, that $15,000 would just mean wealthy people have less far to travel to get their paid organ donations. And look, I'm not an ANCAP, so I guess we stay with altruism, right? process so rare that good Samaritan donors, donors who donate without anyone in mind, have to undergo round after round of psychological tests to prove they don't have some kind of complex, some instability. Even though organ donation is considered a safe surgical procedure, with the risk of death being 3 in 10,000, the idea that you'd go through it for a loved one we accept, but we consider it insane that you'd do it for a stranger, be altruistic for someone you don't know, because we live under capitalism, because our acts of kindness are often commodified. And we've also made it illegal, unspeakable, to think about compensating people. And so the organ shortage progresses. And if you need one, well, good luck on your own. And if you don't have access to socialized medication or to a trust fund, or you are one of the people in the global south who doesn't have the money to feed yourself, let alone pay a kidney donor, well... There's not much in the way of altruism or the market, which helps. I don't know what the solution is. <sighs> Something about this feels too easy, too sinister. Maybe while our Satan sits, we could try and get to the bottom of this by thinking about some of the other ways we can make money using our bodies. Here's a wild way to make some cash, but it's risky and it's gonna hurt. While kidney donation has a death rate of three in 10,000, this has a death rate of one in 1,000 in the United States. It takes longer too, the better part of a year, and it's full time, no nights or weekends off, it is painful and uncomfortable, and it could have lifelong negative impacts on your body, but in many parts of the world, it's a legal way to make money. 
It's surrogacy. It's the process of creating a new human being for nine months. For money. Usually, the story goes something like this. Someone wants a baby, but for whatever reason, they're not able to have one. Both people in the couple lack wombs, or all people in the group have medical complications. For whatever reason, we're talking about a person who wants a baby, but can't gestate one. Pairing with a person who can gestate, and they make an arrangement. And like with paid organ donation, this upsets some people. It upsets conservatives, who point out that this will mean queer people have access to raising families like everyone else. That's bad for some reason. It upsets some radical feminists who see the piecemeal commodification of wombs as an objectification of femininity. And of course, equating wombs with femaleness is a telltale sign that at least some surrogacy abolitionists come with a hint of turf. And surrogacy upsets some Marxists, too, who see the exploitation of desperate people just so they can produce a baby for a wealthy family as, well, grotesque and bourgeois. But wait, I hear you type. If surrogacy is so bad, wh why come pregnancy so good, hmm? Great question, Tyler. What are some of the differences between non-commercial pregnancy and surrogacy? Because much of the scary stuff, the death rates, antenatal depression, risk of complications, that goes for both of them. You are, in being pregnant, having your body co-opted by a violent process to support a future other. Quote! Birth injuries are so common that nature must intend for women to be used up in the process of reproduction just as salmon die after spawning. And pregnancy is largely alienated work, work which gets subsumed into the feminine mystique language of miracles. Pregnancy with all its body horror is celebrated under the right conditions. Pregnancy is that knowing smile, strangers grabbing your belly, always good to have people you don't know touching you, and it's not considered work. Maternity leave is often thought of as time off, not a sick leave. No, it's, uh, it's, have you enjoyed your time off? Have you enjoyed this miracle of nature? Labeling pregnancy as work may help give proper language to the process by which it is physically exhausting and dangerous labor to grow another being for nearly a year. Or think about it this way. You know all those times your employer could have just paid you properly instead of having team building retreats and everybody dress up like Bob Ross days? Yeah? Well, those are the conditions under which all women's labor exists, paid exclusively in congratulations and chiffon. And if we say that pregnancy is work and requires consent, then there needs to be an ability to quit that work too, to say, this task is too hard on my body or, or on my spirit, or for whatever reason, I can't do it anymore. Just like with any other job. I, are we kind of doing the reductionist thing here? We're just... We're just saying that pregnancy is a job and then set that in stone oh and then God. just move Neil, on to abortion. We talked about this. Like, it's helpful to say, maybe not pregnancy is a job, but it's helpful to say pregnancy is labor. Is it helpful? Are yes! We being, Neil, are it's you, helpful. What are you doing? Don't come in the essay. The, you're that side. It's Sarah! Sarah. Like, it's helpful if you look at it from a body perspective. Like, <sighs> this is mine. And I have to give my consent in order for it to get used for any purpose. Consent is the next part of the essay. Yeah, okay, but it's important here too. Like, one of the key components about consent is that it's ongoing, right? Like, I can start doing something with somebody and everything is good. And then suddenly, I don't know, I have a like cramp or I just don't feel like it anymore. And after that point, if I say stop, everything stops, right? I should be able to say that at any time. Right. Right, like like if I asked you to stop like fucking up my video essay. Right, exactly. Okay, so we can think about our organ donation example because the thing that we codified up front was that involuntary organ donation is bad, evil, because we can debate the extent to which you can consent to sell your organs given your circumstances, but if you're saying, I don't consent, I mean... We let people withdraw consent all the way up to the operating table. Like, sometimes people break long chains of donors, and it's awful, and it's sad, but it is within their right, right? Yeah. It's Sarah's part of the essay now. It's my part of the essay. So, 
I still don't understand how it's helpful to say that pregnancy is a job. So it goes back to the famous paper by Judith Jarvis Thompson, which argues if someone wants to co-opt your body to support another person, like if you are non-consensually surgically attached to a famous violinist, and if you get them surgically removed, they'll die. Kind of like human centipede, but more highbrow. Well, it shouldn't matter how long they want to be attached for or how important they are. They don't have a right to your body, even if they'll die without using it without borrowing your circulatory system, as is the case here. Their right to life doesn't trump my right to control my own body, your right to control your own body, and to consent. Well, uh, abortion should, of, of course, be accessible. That's the most ugly, horrific fucking analogy I've, I've ever heard. You could convince any pro-lifers with your surgically attached chalice. Violinist. It doesn't... Matter. It's the most widely reprinted essay in all of contemporary philosophy. Oh, with these bickering content creators. Well, look, this isn't about that essay per se. This is about someone's body and pregnancy and what that means. Because pregnancy is hard work. It's not a thing that happens. It's a being that someone creates in a difficult and creative process. And giving birth is literally called labor. It's a skill that you have to learn and practice. It's not something that happens on its own. And we can debate whether work is good or necessary. In a different essay. Beyond whether work itself is necessary, beyond whether perpetuating the species is necessary or even good, the, the process is taxing. It's creative, but it's work, not an obligation and not a natural miracle. It's labor. And plus, in a lot of people's minds, babies are good. Like, if we consider children to be a group that society needs, then the process of creating them and perpetuating our species is good. We can debate that. But I dislike David Benatar, and I hate eco-fascists. And I think life is probably good, and I think it's time that the people who gestate and choose to give birth should be seen not just as doing this neutral thing with their bodies, but as creating something. Like any other job, gestators have a right to quit. And if that upsets you, Sophie Lewis says you're falling afoul of the moral blackmail that gets used on people in caring professions, like nurses and teachers who are told, you can't go on strike, people's lives are at stake. Which, when you cut it to its core, means that people in altruistic professions are guilted and coerced, into accepting negative labor conditions because other people's well-being is privileged while their well-being is being violated. And that's bullshit. Abortion should be accessible and affordable and easy because I'm not gonna tell a pregnant person that they have to use their body to support another being for any reason, even if that being is the world's best violinist. Okay, uh, well, that was meant to be my section, so goodbye, Sarah. All right, get back into position. Uh, it... Perfect. Ready to go to the next part of the essay? That abortion dilemma, by the way, is from an essay, which I really don't like, by the philosopher Judith Jarvis Thompson. One of her other works was actually an expansion of Philippa Foote's trolley problem. She's the one who added the conditions about uh, pushing someone onto the track rather than uh, flipping a switch, and why even when the math of the event is the same, save one, kill five, the situation feels different. She posited that killing isn't inherently worse than letting die. A philosopher famous for abortion and ethics. Had you heard of her? No? She died just under a year ago in 2020, and yet you've all heard of the famous philosopher and theologian who bullies undergraduates for a living. Bean. Shart. So, okay, pregnancy is labor, like it is, but making it an economically incentivized practice the way we do with surrogacy has some flaws. Surrogacy in many ways reflects the worst excesses of the capitalist vision. These processes are alienation, where labor gets transformed into a commodity, Exploitation. Where someone uses a person as an object for their benefit and Commodification. Where everything in a capitalist society can be purchased. Alienation, labor becoming a commodity, doesn't seem particularly worse in the case of surrogacy than, than anything else. 
unless you want to argue that that something of the body has a, a uniquely sacred space, then labor is labor and creation is creation and garment factory worker is a gestator is a chef. Exploitation, someone using someone else, you know, that's different. That, that's one focus that many surrogacy abolitionists have, have, have taken up, and for good reason. At the time of this essay, commercial surrogacy is legal in the United States, Iran, Ukraine, Russia, Israel, Guatemala, Mexico, Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and Kenya. Until 2015, India was on that list too, and women undoubtedly suffered. Those who chose to be surrogates were often low-caste women, typically with little education and from rural areas. And they were sometimes mistreated, restrained in hostels, having their eating, drinking, and exercise controlled, and having their access to visit their family or friends restricted. This system goes against the Kantian argument that people have inherent value and should be treated as ends unto themselves rather than means. However, now that international surrogacy has been banned in India, many surrogates and former surrogates are saying that their lives are worse now. When international surrogacy became illegal, surrogates took to the streets in protest. Surrogacy for single mothers and LGBT individuals is going to be banned next to the dismay of current workers. Two-time surrogate Savita Vasava, who used her first surrogacy to fund a transition from being a maid to owning a small shop and was considering a second surrogacy to save for her daughter's wedding, sums it up nicely. It is one way for us to make a better life. Even if we work day and night, we cannot save this kind of money. Surrogacy may be a gendered, exploitative and stigmatized type of labor, but it is still the best option for labor that many people have. A pragmatist here will point out that the issues underlying all of these conditions, it's not pregnancy, it's poverty. If oppressed people are being coerced into situations which they would not consent to except under duress, then it's not the situations that are default bad. It's the system. It's the caste system, the patriarchy, neoliberal capitalism, the whole fucking lot of it. We see this reflected in our media reckoning with surrogacy. When it's done altruistically, we generally applaud it. Like organ donation, we put aside all moral qualms about engaging with this invasive bodily process altruistically. But when it's done for pay, we are suddenly horrified. And there's logic to this argument. A person forced into a low-paying job to avoid starvation is being both under-rewarded and exploited, whereas a rich person deciding to volunteer for a group and getting paid the same amount as a thank you is still being under-rewarded, but not being exploited. We can say much more confidently that the consent to work given by the wealthy person was valid, and that the labour of the wealthy person was unproblematic. However, is the answer to this to just ban surrogacy, as, as like what happened in, in India. Force women back to garment factories where their labor is just as exploited, but even more under-rewarded. Surrogates aren't calling for saviors. They're calling for solidarity. But none of that is even to speak of the real shared disgust here, commodification. Because there is something morally disgusting across political divides about babies being commodities. I think here, even the most laissez-faire capitalist gets a bit squeamish at, for example, economists Landis and Posner's assertion that we should just set up a market for direct and unobscured buying and selling of babies. Instead, we use flowery and meaningless euphemism. Babies are life. Babies are miracle. Babies are the future. We seem pretty capable of talking about babies as commodities when discussing otherized people anyway. People talking about the shift from hunter-gatherer societies to agrarian ones often like to wax about the number of children people had and how they are or are not useful for a specific lifestyle. We like to talk about welfare queens and say that some people have babies as a means of making money. Not like me. I only make money. Money. People have babies purely as a means of making money. Not like me. I only make babies so that daddy will know he can trust me with his inheritance. No, 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 of course. All babies only exist for magical and good reasons. Yikes. I told you it was going to be a wild fucking essay. So babies are beings who are grown and produced, and they can be, if not bought and sold, transferred from person to person. And while I really think, and I believe it is healthy and good to think, that babies, people in fact, 
should belong only to themselves. They are thought of in society as belonging to a person or a couple. Surrogacy pulls back the curtain on the process by which life itself is a commodity that is created. Commercial surrogacy is plainly the leasing of one individual's reproductive capabilities to create a baby which will be transferred to another individual. And while some people may try to say that the process of pregnancy is the thing that's actually being paid for, the fact remains that surrogates are not paid in full until a live baby has swapped hands. Until someone comes up with a non-fudgeable NFT baby. What the fuck is wrong with you internet people? And anyway, I don't know about this whole passing on genetic information thing, you know? It's kind of weird, kind of old-fashioned, a bit eugenics-y. Like, I'm lucky to have two kids, and they're lucky enough not to look much like me. Who gives a shit? It's weird. Give your house to someone else. We've spoken before on this channel about all the ways the family can be queered or rethought. And frankly, there are so many ways to be a parent that I, I find it difficult personally to twist the world into a shape that makes surrogacy a fair thing to feel entitled to. All comments, of course, to be addressed to my co-writer, Sarah. I haven't even gotten to the bit, and I don't know if I will, where I talk about body horror. Body horror as a rhetorical device wielded by conservatives. Wielded against surrogacy, yes, but also against trans people. It gets wielded against fat people. There is no small amount of body horror involved in certain forms of homophobia. But life, having a body, is Horrific. It's horror all the time. Having a tooth pulled, being dysphoric, having an eating disorder, chronic pain, injury, giving birth, going through puberty. When it comes to bodies, the horror is written into the fabric of the beauty. And on that note, why don't you and I finally, finally talk about sex? <laughs> So much room under here. Oh, what's it? Oh my god! Masaitan! Nice! Mmm! That's one of the best things we've ever cooked on the channel. Sarah, you want some seitan? And maybe afterwards. So, get this right. I have a body. Hey, Neil, uh, do it again and a little more sensual. How are you, how are you able to see me? Like, we're still making a video essay, just more sensual. That was peak sensual. <sighs> no. I have a body. Better. But you're not looking at me, are you? You're looking at my presentation, and that presentation is artificial, from the badly applied eyeliner to the purple lips to, believe it or not, this is not my natural hair color. Hell, even to the lighting, the color correction I'm going to do on the edit. Whoa, and it's a lot of work, too, to create this illusion. So is this fake? Transphobes would certainly say that it is, that it is fake and only fake because I'll never I'll be a never real be woman. A real woman. I'm, I'm non-binary, guys. Trans women are despised by gender fascists because they do something unforgivable. They take the rules of the game and they make them explicit. They show femininity is a mode of being that can and must be purchased. The existence of trans women makes manifest the fact that femininity, all femininity, is an illusion. Are we really saying that? Are, are we saying that all femininity is an illusion? Yeah, that's how we wrote it in the script. Uh, but is it true, though? Well, like, femininity can feel right, and every other iteration of gender expression can feel wrong, but that doesn't mean they're not all constructed. But, like, we can't go into Butler in this essay on bioethics. Can we just keep it simple? All right. Okay. So, all femininity is an illusion. After all, cis women also wax their faces, shave their pubic hair, spend hours of their lives with their hands trapped and useless because they're waiting for their top coat of nail varnish to dry. And then they go into the world and hide the labor of being presentably gendered the pinnacle of performing femininity well is the idea that it's natural. It's, I just woke up like this. It's easy, breezy, beautiful. It's, you don't know you're beautiful. That's what makes you beautiful. It's, maybe she's born with it. This is too easy. Enjoy playing this awful game at home. But femininity is not natural. Femininity is work. And it's work 
that when undertaken can get someone ahead socially or financially. Of course, plenty of people don't, and they're still people, they still have their genuine gender identity, but there are social punitive measures that interact with this, whether that's a butch woman being interrogated on her way into a bathroom, or just, you know, hot girl gets nice thing, other people don't get nice thing. Whether or not we choose to participate in this game is kind of irrelevant. Gender Jumanji wants to be played, and euphemisms like professionalism, presentability, cleanliness, making an effort, all of that sexist, classist, judgment shit, well, that's all tied up in how we look. Ask any female or femme-presenting server at a restaurant if they get tipped more on days when they're wearing makeup, or when they're flirting a little. Or think of what we mean when we say friendliness. That flight attendant was friendly. That nurse wasn't. How much of that, how much of being good at your job or worth tipping, is based on some hidden little dance of gendered ways of moving one's body? In work and dating and social power, sexuality can become a so nearly overt way of accumulating social or literal capital. So what are we doing? Just forget the whole thing and just directly exchange sex for money. The world's on fire, you sexy little goblins. We've got to get out there and start Neil, fucking Neil. for cash. Neil, no songs this episode. Oh yeah, like a few people actually quit their jobs after the last episode, so at a certain point, like we're kind of going power mad. What issues do people have with sex work? Well, let's go for the easy ones first. It's dirty, it's immoral, it's not natural. In normal heterosexual sex, all orgasms are real 100% of the time, and all reasons for having sex are congruent and pretty. Whenever I'm having normal sex with a vanilla straight person, I always think, this is fine, but sex for money? Absolute filth. Yuck. Sometimes my fellow sex-positive comrades will focus on these arguments because they're stupid and easy, and how they're based in overt misogyny is like really easy to see and the people who peddle them are fun to laugh at, and we can speculate about how shitty their sex lives must be. But there are other arguments against sex work which are harder to grapple with, and we're doing ourselves a disservice by refusing to stare them directly in the face. And before you level the charge at me, let me say that I know that the porn industry, for example, is not singularly positive. But that lack of naivety on my part does not make me prudish. Do I look prudish to you? Does this feel like you're hanging out with a prude right now? Do you think I'm afraid of sex? Because it's not dirty. Because sex isn't dirty. I know people who are sex workers. I've heard stories over clients in joyful tears and of fulfilled professionals experiencing things that they never would have otherwise experienced. Sex work, like every intersection of garbage and flowers, of course has the potential to be transcendent. But the ew gross aspect is not the only argument you can make against sex work. One of the most central arguments relies on consent, and because of that we need to define our terms. We're going to talk about affirmative consent, and a warning in advance, things may be about to get a little heteronormative around here. Sorry, <laughs> that's because critics conceptualize sex work as an almost exclusively female profession, and we're answering the critics. So this is going to be some feminism on feminism action, but I digress. What is consent? Neil asks. There are thousands of queer leftist poly subscribers. Well, affirmative consent requires that everyone who participates in sexual activity say that they're into it enthusiastically. It's not no means no, it's yes means yes. So actually we're trying to combat the heteronormative social script where the man pursues and the woman relents and pivot to one where everyone in the pair or group is excited to be there, excited for the things to be happening. In that sense, affirmative consent switches the role of a woman in sex from passive to active. Affirmative consent requires enthusiasm. It requires that someone in the pair or group stop as soon as someone else seems like they're lackluster. It also is ongoing. For all of the bad comedians making jokes about getting someone to sign consent contracts, <laughs> give me a Netflix special, you cowards! That's just expressly not how it works. It's not sign here and here and then you're required to do these things. It's asking, do you like your ears touched? And, oh, you seem to like having your hair pulled. And it requires a scanning of someone to make sure they're still interested and engaged. Or if you're not good at scanning, it may require a lot of overt communication throughout the whole thing. Because, as queer people have been screaming for our entire existence, sex isn't about a moment of penetration, it's the whole ongoing process. 
and women aren't a collection of orifices to be penetrated as reactionary conservative crusaders like Julie Bindle imagine. They're independent beings who should be just as invested in the process as any male or non-binary person. I mean, the fact that I wear lipstick does seem to lead people on Reddit to assume all kinds of things about me and penetration and my bum. And guys, I hate to disappoint you, but you could never afford me. No, the assumption that being penetrated is a prerequisite of femininity, femininity which is so fucking abstract and scripted and busy with the business of being femininity, well, that's just textbook misogyny, isn't it? And no, the answer to that is not to peg the patriarchy no more than it would be helpful to have free market capitalism lick my bumhole. <laughs> I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy. No, what we're trying to do is to correct for the misogyny in how we frame what sex is and what consent is. And this is important because the second wave anti-sex work framing often relies on a central thesis that sex work is not work, either because sex is somehow sacred, a path which, if you follow it to its logical conclusion, leads to all sorts of bad takes about purity and mononormativity, about the feminine feckin' mystique and self-worth being linked to body parts. Or, or we end up with that problem of thinking sex work is fundamentally about a man renting access to a woman's body, or her holes, anyway. As if the sex worker is signing that contract, as if she can't say stop, as if she can't say this is off limits, or as if she isn't continually speaking, negotiating, and advocating for herself in the room the same way she would without a monetary exchange. This is a major reason why so many of the loudest and most prominent sex work abolitionists are also TERFs. Gender isn't complicated or performative, gender is about have vagina. Have vagina, I'm one. I'm warm, have vagina, no come in my hoggy house. And come on, friends, this conception of sex and sex work is clearly based on such old and weathered conceptions of womanhood, and they're bad conceptions. Now, still some anti-sex work advocates will say, somewhat persuasively, that for consent to be valid, it must be freely given. And so we hit the big question of the essay, can sex workers consent? Or... How can someone give true affirmative consent for sex if they are marginalized under hierarchical or capitalist structure? If it's between not eating and sucking cock, have you really given meaningful consent? And before you argue that that's a little patronizing to the power and autonomy and self-awareness of the sex worker in question, I refer you to the bit we just did about organ selling and surrogacy. But many individuals post-donation have insignificant capital to rise up from poverty and end up back in debt. I refer you to the hellscape we live in and your own life, where you've done awful things for money. You're still powerful, you still have autonomy, but Jumanji wants to be played. In heteronormative, gendered world, we are bad at consent. Maybe not you, or you, but all the rest of you are. During sex, we're bad at consent, and we can say that without giving up on sex. It is possible to have beautiful, impressive, athletic sex, and to continuously check in. Are you okay? Is this okay? It's possible to have fun while you're doing that and be transcendent. You can have kinky power exchange sex dynamics and, and still base it around affirmative consent. But it is not possible to do that when you've got someone like, uh, we've got a cum shot to film here. So are you going to take that cum all over your face or should we just all pack up and go home? Because you have a feeling. We aren't good at consent in our personal lives, but the way we're bad at consent is exacerbated by monetary exchange. And I think actually that the discourse here fails. The movements around the consent first framing of sexuality and full tilt sex positivity slash porn positivity and intersectional Marxist feminism are all in tension with each other. Intersectional leftist feminism, especially the rad femme and Marxist types, will often tell you that you cannot measure consent under a system like patriarchy or capitalism or God help us both. Your sex and porn positive girl boss feminism must necessarily be blind to what consent is and how it happens, and a framing of consent that is as simple as, did she say yes, we all know is just not fucking good enough. These views, which I'm sure large parts of my audience hold simultaneously, are in conflict with each other. And because of that, I can't actually say all sex work is good, actually. Because as is often said, we live in society. And while there are plenty of sex workers who love sex work, who love being perceived as objects of desire, who get off on exhibitionism or worship or doming or any of the other number of ways that people can interact with being desirable beings with bodies, there are plenty of people 
who do sex work because they need money. There are disproportionate amounts of trans women in sex work and immigrants, people who are suffering from mental health or substance abuse disorders. Are we supposed to not notice that? Is, is it supposed to be a coincidence? Or do we just willfully ignore the intersections of disenfranchised groups so we can make broader, more libertarian, more simplistic points that swerfs are so dumb and, and just, just keep that Pornhub tab open, bro. You're a fucking feminist, my dude. I think here, right here, is where we need to stop and ask ourselves, what then are we actually doing? Sex work isn't a moral question in the abstract. Sex work is common. Most of you watching will have engaged with sex work in some way. How to delete internet history. And when a real world issue affects real world group of people, we shouldn't turn that part of our brain off. And we shouldn't go into white savior mode either. Oh, those poor women. Oh, those poor lost souls. We'll fix them up and put them in suits and get them an education, make soliciting prostitution illegal. And then they'll never have to do this dirty, dirty work again. Not like me. I'm not dirty. I'm Julie Bindle. I'm an adult human female. No. What we need to do is the thing we never do when it comes to dealing with the socially complex thing. Listen to the people involved. Listen to what sex workers are saying. That sex work is work and that stigma and criminalization make them less safe. A systematic review and meta-analysis of 40 quantitative studies and 94 qualitative studies found one resounding result. Criminalization hurts sex workers. Policing of sex workers was associated with a greater incidence of violence towards sex workers, of HIV transmission, of condomless sex. It was associated with abuses of power like bribery, arbitrary arrests, extortion, and physical or sexual violence. It pushed sex workers into isolated areas and disrupted peer support networks, leading to more dangerous scenarios. It exacerbated inequalities experienced by sex workers with intersecting marginalized identities. And this is where I have to come down, despite any discomfort I have about how people get treated in our capitalist patriarchal world. If we're going to say that we foundationally do not want sex workers to be mistreated or abused, then we should listen to them. They have told us through more than 134 studies and through countless advocacy groups, and they've told us criminalization does not save them, it puts them in greater danger. Sex workers don't need saving, they need solidarity. Which again, isn't to say that sex work is all good. Nuance is a thing. If someone is choosing between hunger and sex work, that's an evil situation. But the work isn't evil and the person doing the work isn't evil. Come on guys, it's the hunger. It's the condition that create the hunger. It's the, the forced choice. It's the conditions that create the forced choice. It's not about the sex. It's about the poverty, the transphobia, the lack of access to mental health services or affordable housing. Sex isn't a bad thing to engage in unless it's forced. So let's create a society where people aren't forced into sex work. The ability to use one's body for generating wages, that's not the problem because we do that in so many other jobs. Where is the narrative about physical consent for boxing? Coal mining, where's the protest about the Olympic Games and how it can only be viewed as violence because one cannot consent under capitalism? Where's the discourse about acting and other uses of the body? We have singled out sex workers because they are feminized. And abolitionists use this narrative to do what conservatives always do, to use the circumstances of the victim to advance their own agenda. Wait, Sarah, do, do we want to say that? Sarah? Sarah? So, you know a guy, huh? Did somebody order Satan? Uh, Satan. Satan. I'm the devil. Gee, what is the leader of an unholy army of the dead gonna do without a hook around here? Uh, have we messed them? Sorry! My bad. Time doesn't exist in hell, so from my perspective, you're already there. I'm, um, I'm all, I'm not. I, I, I go to hell. Are you really that surprised? Besides, hell isn't that bad a place. We host weekly boggle tournaments. You win once, I think. Anyway.
Anyway, what do you want to talk to me about, pal? Uh, capitalism and its relationship to the body. Oh, neat! I am super into buying organs, so that is right up my alley. Uh, okay. Uh, well, this is actually more about how um, poverty and wealth inequality uh, forces people into situations where they have to decide which parts of themselves they have to sell. Neil. Neil. Why you always gotta be such a grouchy Gus all the time? I mean, can't you ever make a video essay about something fun like puppies or flowers or pulsating rivers of blood? God, you're weird. Not as weird as God. Um, maybe you, you can help me. I, I feel like we're leaning like too much on abstract philosophical concepts or absolutes in this essay and not really digging into why bodies and sex are so confusing and shameful under the current system. I feel like there's something huge and all-encompassing just beyond these awful conversations where women's bodies are reduced to reproductive parts and and the poorer you are the more you, you get described as meat. It's like the capitalist ideology reduces poor and oppressed people into body horror meat puppet parodies and it turns the wealthy into the divine. And plus, how, how much of this is my own internalized shit? Like how much of my skepticism is just Catholic discomfort? You know, I, I really don't have a horse in this race. I have no corporeal form. Wish I did. This is just a projection of how your subconscious mind perceives the devil. Which would explain why these horns are so phallic and so small. They're, they're nice. Thanks, I like your slutty little cat ears. Thank you. So, what did you tell them to do? Who? Your funny little friends over here. Oh, oh, I'm, I just uh, did the usual, to be honest, uh, Satan. Um, capitalism is bad, poverty has to go, um, community and solidarity are good, etc. So what does it matter how you got there? I don't know, I, I just uh, shook myself a little with, with this essay in all sorts of ways. The most compelling argument for abortion being this awful thought experiment where they... They, they, like, they stitch you, you to the violinist! I love that! We do that all the time in hell. It never gets old. D do? Yeah, in hell. Where I'm from. Almost every famous violinist, we attach them to the funniest little people. <laughs> we like to have fun. But yeah, I wouldn't overly concern yourself with shame, you know? Shame is the feeling you're supposed to feel so we pay our rent on time. And I do not like paying the rent on time. Satan has a landlord. Yeah, yeah, what's his name? God! The big middle class wanker in the sky. Which is why when you die, Neil, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grind up your body into its constituent chemicals and sell them on the black market to make, realistically, about four hundred dollars. That doesn't make any. That doesn't make any sense. I know, right? In one hand, I have the other. Workers of the afterlife unite. Well, call me old-fashioned, but I believe that people should be paid for their labor, and we shouldn't just pay the person who owns the shit. All oh, right. Um... There. Now I can actually give you advice. Thanks, patrons. Well, it's just that I'm you know, worried that we, we haven't dealt with my personal shit. I haven't dealt with my personal shit around sex work and, and surrogacy and, and, and all these subjects that we're talking about. And we, we didn't even do the race thing. We did it again where we didn't talk about how this intersects with race. Like Angela Davis has been, has been talking about surrogacy through, through a racial lens since like the 90s. So we're not doing anything innovative here. And I just think we're just poking like a big mess and it, we're gonna end up making our first problematic video essay. So to save you from making a problematic essay, you turn to Satan. Mm. That's easy though, problematic. I mean, problematic compared to what? What do you mean? Compared to what, Neely? So you make a shitty essay. Compared to who else? Compared to not making one? Is that what you really want? Would that be praxis? People used to say all sorts of shit was wrong. You know, divorce is wrong. Oh yeah, is it Tyler? Compared to what? Compared to two people hating each other and using their children as currency that can never pay off the indentured horror of their chosen misery? Meh, Neil, you're not having a crisis. You just need a big, generous portion of compared to what? You've read Sophie Lewis. I have. I read uh, Lori Penny. 
because I thought meat market would be about people eating each other's faces and hanging hawks of flesh. Um, kind of a bummer that it wasn't, to be honest, but I still liked it. And, uh, and now I like to dabble in feminist works, mostly to piss off the big guy. And you were like squabbling lovers. What did he tell you? What? <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. Once. And it was horrible. I mean, you have no idea. I mean, for a god with a capital G, you think he would have been able to find mine. God is a top. Yeah, but I was like a, a power bottom. Uh, which makes sense, considering I rule over the underworld. <laughs> then afterwards he made me watch the Shawshank Redemption. Which is so bizarre. I mean, that is just not a, a sexy movie. Uh, anyway, things have been kind of awkward between us ever since. Okay. Well, I don't know if it was the sex or the time I uh, invented Britain. But either way, there's been a lot of tension there. Okay. I mean, talk about an overreaction. You know, I stage one Marxist revolt in heaven and try to make the universe an equal place built on love instead of everybody having to worship some old white guy. But no... I make people disembowel a few goats in my honor and possess David Berkowitz's dog once as a hilarious prank and suddenly I am the bad guy? If that isn't history being written by the winner, I do not know what is. Am I evil? Evil compared to what, Neil? Well, don't water it down. I was just starting to feel better about the whole thing, wasn't I? Aw, looks so cute when you're despondent. Makes me want to grind you up and sell your organs to God. You don't actually sell organs, do you? No. Because that would be evil. Evil? Compared to what? Hell has free housing. There's no shame, no discrimination. We have a free Lewis. And all you have to do is give up your organs. Consensually. Evil compared to heaven? Where all the devout Christians go. You know, heaven's full of billionaires. It's like an episode of Succession, but with less hot people. God is the biggest capitalist I know. He makes Gordon Gecko look like Hrap Brown. Right, well, thank you for your, all of your advice. Uh, thank you. That's what a fiver and a couple of dimples will get you. Hey, Neil.